Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome all of you to today's program titled Real Learning, How Jewish Day Schools Are Starting the School Year. Back to school is a phrase that we use every year. And I know this year it means something very different to many of us. And it bring, this year brings new challenges and opportunities. Whether it's online or in person, Jewish Day Schools have spent countless hours preparing their communities for the start of an unprecedented school year. And today we are fortunate to be joined by experts in the field who will lead us in a conversation about reopening, student teacher safety, the logistics of schools, schooling during a pandemic, and changes to some of the educational approaches. And now I'm happy to introduce Paul Bernstein, the CEO of Prisma, who will start us off today by framing the conversation further and introduce today's presenters. And before I even do that, I just want to thank you all I want to personally thank all of you for joining and also thank the, the presenters. I know this week is an incredibly busy week for, for people that are involved in schools. And, and I said this to them before, but I wanted to say this again. Is like, I was almost, I thought it was, I was a little bit embarrassed even to ask them to come and present when I knew it would be super busy. And I was so grateful for people to be so generous with their time and their wisdom to join us today to, to share what's been going on because it's so top of mind. And so with that, I just wanna show my gratitude and thank you again. And after that, and now I wanna say thank you, Paul and Hana from Prisma who have been wonderful partners. And I would like to introduce, introduce Paul Bernstein who will frame the conversation and introduce our, our fellow panelists today. Thank you, Paul. Hi everyone, I am Paul Bernstein. I'm the CEO of Prisma Center for Jewish Day Schools. Great to see many familiar faces and uh, wonderful that everyone is able to, to join us. Uh, a thank you to Tamar and uh, to our partnership with the Jewish Funders Network. Um, it is great working with you and uh, we hugely appreciate the way that you have facilitated conversation around <laughs> Jewish day schools throughout the COVID crisis among your members. Uh, and among our friends in the in the funding world as well. So it's it's a pleasure to be able to have this conversation. It's incredibly valuable to be able to do it at the time when some schools have been in session now for two to three weeks. Some schools are beginning to, are going into session. Um, uh, my colleague Hana was sharing before her kids have their first full day today. We're still waiting till next week. And even that won't be a full week. So gradually everything is getting back to what the fall will become. And that really is, you know, our subject today is real learning how Jewish day schools are starting the school year. And we really want to engage in a conversation, uh, not just presentations. We have fantastic presenters who I will introduce in a moment, giving different perspectives from one school, uh, uh, one school perspective, from a whole community perspective, and then what we at Prisma are learning across North America in terms of the trends that we see in schools, reflecting the incredible work that, um, that they are all doing. I want to just sort of make a few opening remarks, then I'll introduce the speakers, hand over to them. We will make this a conversation. So if you have questions that are coming up while people are speaking, please share them in the chat. If you want to say hello to someone else on the call, or you want to say hello to everyone on the call, please share them in the chat. The idea is we make this informal um, and that we, we build relationships among a group that I know, seeing who's on this call, is deeply, deeply committed uh, to, to Jewish day schools. Um, as I think uh, most, if not all of you know, uh, we, our role as Prisma in the last six months has been to, um, to really try and enable schools and their community representatives to respond to the crisis as it is happening, to, 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 to give them access to the resources that really will help them think through and do their jobs in the best possible way, and also to uh, be able to share among themselves. That's one of the richest pieces I think we've had and a real strength of the day school community is the ability for our leaders at the school level and at the community level and at the funder level to be able to work together. So right now, for example, people are sharing among themselves videos for the welcome back to school and, and I'm sure taking ideas from one another. They're sharing some of their experiences and we're waiting now to see how we can learn from each other. For example, as God forbid, there are cases that inevitably that will happen 
uh, are within schools and how we respond to those, especially for the vast majority of schools that are open in some form in person and their ability to respond without having to close everything back down unless we absolutely need to and, re and revert to full virtual learning. It's been incredible to see the way that school leaders and teachers have worked extraordinarily hard throughout the crisis and over this very unusual summer that we've been experiencing. And I just want on behalf of everyone on this call, on behalf of everyone involved in Prisma, just to say a, a very quick word of thanks and kola kavod to each person and the work that they have done. It's been uh, relentless, it's been hard work. I am hoping that everyone did manage some form of break over the summer and therefore is somewhat refreshed to be able to, um, to come back to school. Um, the determination of schools to work together in order, if it is safe to do so, to be open in person has been extraordinary to see. The amount that um, people have invested to try and make back to school in person possible, the amount they have invested to make sure that they can cater for those who it, for whom it is not possible to get back in person to school, whether for health reasons or because they feel unable for other reasons, and to make sure that they can accommodate the needs of the full range of students, as well as accommodate the needs of faculty, some of whom it's also difficult to be in person. So to see that work happening, to see the creativity of the work has been incredible, to see the way that funders have stepped up to support very substantial expense that schools have had to uh, engage in, and that includes individual funders, it includes foundations, it includes many federations that have worked incredibly hard with their schools, and we'll hear more about that a little bit later. Um, I think we can be incredibly proud of what our Jewish day schools are doing in service of our students and our families, and how we keep them at the center of uh, of our attention and our work and as Prisma we are delighted to be able to work with such a, an, a, an innovative, determined, creative field of leaders uh, throughout. What I'd like to do now is, is to introduce uh, the three wonderful guests and speakers who we are going to listen to and then we will have discussion um, uh, after that. Uh, first, I'm delighted to welcome Erica Rothblum, who is the head of school at the Pressman, Pressman Academy of Temple Betham in Los Angeles. Um, Erica has been one of the heads of school who has done so much for her school over many years and through COVID crisis. And Erica, I hope you will pass on our thanks to your team uh, and we will hear from you in a moment. Then uh, we're going to listen to Audrey Maman, who is the program manager at the, uh, in the educational services team at the Center for, for the Advancement of Jewish Education, SAGE, which is an agency of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Uh, SAGE works incredibly hard with the schools throughout Miami and uh, Audrey will share with us um, uh, what they have been learning, what they've been experiencing, what they've been doing in support of the schools. And uh, third, Adelia Epstein, who is the director of the Knowledge Center at Prisma, uh, and leads a lot of our efforts to gather and engage in the incredibly important data and knowledge sharing that goes on all the time across North America. Um, uh, and uh, Adelia will share with us some of that perspective uh, when we come to it. As I said before, please, as you're listening and you have questions or comments, share them in the chat. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them and either come to them as we're going along or come back to them when we get into the discussion later. But on that note, uh, uh, welcome, Erica, and thank you very much for being with us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate it. And you know, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about our school and you know, some of the decisions that we've had to make over the last few months and, and how we've been doing that. Just to give you a little background on Pressman, we are an ECC, early childhood. We start at age two through eighth grade school, about 500 students, 100 staff members um, in the Pico Robertson area of Los Angeles. Um, and as Paul said, we're part of Temple Beth Am with a conservative synagogue in the city. We're just, uh, lo we're located just south of Beverly Hills. When I say just south, literally like the other side of the street is Beverly Hills. Um, but we are a solidly, what I would call Los Angeles middle-class community. 
And that's important to know because as we you know, looked at this crisis, as we looked at what we were going to be facing in terms of reopening, um, we, did, we are not a school with deep reserves. We are not a school with deep endowment. And so we had to really figure out how we were going to plan for the year. Um, last March, when we first closed down and, and moved, shifted to distance learning, we really thought about the resources we had and how could we use them. And one of the decisions we made at the time is that we, one of our core values has to do with community and caring for people and the social emotional health of adults and children. And so we decided instead of spending all of our time, all of our efforts in making the absolute best math class that there was, of course math class had to be good, we really wanted to focus on caring for the people in our community. And so that has been a theme that, that I'll trace for you over the last six months. Um, and so when, I guess around like April or May, we started planning for, at the time, I would call it two scenarios. You know, at, the, at this point, there's like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and so forth. But um, what we, we put together a task force of staff, of lay leaders, we were looking at CDC and LA County recommendations and guidelines, identified our needs and realized that we were going to need significant funds in order to reopen the school. We were really fortunate that two of our um, really generous supporters came forward with a $300,000 matching grant. And over the course, in, actually just in the month of June, over the course of four weeks, we raised an additional $345,000, so $645,000 in total. In addition, we were able to receive two grants from our local federation. Um, one was for the synagogue and the school together for some facilities upgrades that was about 40,000 and one for ECC scholarships. And so those two were able to offset some of the additional costs. And I would say, I'll get to it. So our ECC, our Early Childhood Center, came back in person on August 10th, um, and they're on campus, and I can tell you a little bit about that. We also, at the time, scenario two was planning for distance learning because we weren't sure whether starting the year or at some point later in the year, we were going to have to move into that scenario. And indeed, uh, because of our governor's uh, responses, uh, or our our governor's guidelines, our kindergarten through eighth grade started online on August 10th. Um, though we are, our numbers are poo poo poo, knock on wood, looking okay. And so we're hopeful that we will start to have some of our older students back on campus within the next few weeks. So some of the investments that we had to make, um, and I think you'll hear about this a little bit more from Odelia, we did have um, an increased need for tuition assistance. We we gave out probably about $300,000, $350,000 additional to what we usually give out in tuition assistance. Um, we also needed, we did facilities upgrades. We, you know, touchless uh, sinks and toilets. We had to bring down walls to make additional classroom space so that we could spread pods out. Um, outside spaces, we're looking at a lot of outside learning and putting out shade, shades and uh, tents. Um, our staffing, we hired someone just to be our distance learning specialist to help support um, this kind of model. Technology was a huge investment. We bought devices so that we had enough for every student kindergarten through eighth grade in our school and also um, in the classrooms so that once we do go back to school, if kids are at home, they can zoom into the class um, and also additional professional development. And so of the 645 that we've raised so far, we have spent about 300, 350,000 of that. Um, and we actually anticipate that a large amount of what is left is going to go back toward to testing, testing student, uh, doing COVID testing of students and staff. Um, and so in all of our planning, just in thinking about um, our approach to things. We say, you know, the first thing that we take into account is medical. We have a medical task force. Whatever they tell us to do, that's how we begin. Um, and after that, our plan is like, what is best for children? That's always the question we ask. Like many communities, we are incredibly diverse. We have families who will, are telling us they will not come back to school until there is a vaccine. And we have families in our school who are angry that we're not suing the governor for, in their words, overstepping. So we really have this broad range of approaches and we realize we are not going to make everyone happy. So our, 
once we have medical advice, our job is to decide what is best for kids as educators and also to think about our core values. And so that has been something that has been incredibly helpful in our planning um, because while people do not always agree with the decisions we're making, we're using a lot of communication where I'm communicating more than I've ever communicated before, a lot of transparent communication so people know who we are, why we're making the decisions that we are making and reminding them about like going back to what I said in March, this idea of holding people. Every family in our school is assigned to an administrator who checks in regularly. The teachers are checking in regularly. And so when people are saying, well, I, you know, I don't understand why you're not doing X, Y, and Z like the school down the street, we can always bring them back to this is who we are as a school. These are the values. These, these are the reasons you chose us. And this is, these are what we're using to make this decision. So people don't always agree with us, but I think that they understand where we're coming from. And that has been incredibly helpful and has garnered us a lot of support as we've navigated this crisis. Erica, thank you. And, and uh, just particularly strikes me how you are balancing all of the technical issues with, as you said, holding people, the care that is so integral to, to what is necessary in school. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, I'll hand over to Audrey. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So SAGE is the Jewish Educational Leadership Agency for the Greater Miami Jewish Community. And it impacts all areas of Jewish uh, education from early childhood all the way to adult Jewish learning and everything in between. Um, we are, as Paul mentioned, a subsidiary agency of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation um, for which Jewish education is uh, an unwavering priority. Um, over $2 million is allocated annually to our 10 Federation funded schools. Um, that encompasses base allocations, grants, uh, scholarships, and teacher fringe benefits. SAGE's responsibility um, with the day schools is focused on educational quality and involves overseeing um, developing new programs, grants, and offering, of course, cutting edge professional development opportunities to our teachers and to our administrators. Um, I just wanna highlight a few key areas that have had an impact during this pandemic. Um, one of our major initiatives, the J Blood Miami Initiative, was funded about five years ago by Avi Chai and some local funders. And um, JBlend develops school capacity for blended learning and has resulted in dramatic shifts um, in teachers' professional practice, student learning, and school culture. Um, in particular, uh, JBlend proved very instrumental during the, the pandemic as teachers had to shift at a moment's notice to distance learning. The original cohort com um, was comprised of the four of, four of our funded schools and seeing how well prepared they were to move to distance learning, the six remaining schools actually reached out to SAGE and um, for support in preparing their teachers uh, for this, this new shift in education that we are all um, experiencing. And we are continuing to provide training in various um, emerging areas of need that come up. Um, we are also responsible for advocating for our 10 funded day schools with the Miami-Dade Public School District um, to make sure that they all receive federal funding like Title II dollars for professional development and Title IV dollars for school program enhancements. And during the pandemic, we were able to advocate on behalf of our schools to get their 2019-2020 dollars um, repurposed for technology without any restrictions. We also um, convene our admissions directors of our 10 funded schools, as well as the admissions directors of the Tri-County area, um, resource specialists, and heads of school. Um, this includes yeshivot, modern orthodox schools, and community day schools. Having this infrastructure of networks in place has proven to be essential um, during this pandemic. Um, at the very onset, when everything started back in March, um, along with Federation, we decided to convene our heads of school and board chairs on a weekly basis. Um, we've provided them with an informal space 
to share ideas, discuss issues or common issues that are happening, give out suggestions, and um, the feedback has been amazing. Um, Federation's Board of Directors has also approved the um, allocation for this upcoming school year um, to not be based on enrollment. And in fact, it'll be based on numbers from last year. Um, additionally, the requirement that schools maintain a certain enrollment, uh, a certain enrollment numbers has been relaxed, so they don't have to worry about that. And um, the Federation also gave out a 53% increase in need-based scholarships for Jewish day school students and is also looking into um, additional financial support to help cover increased expenses due to COVID. Um, Thank you. And uh, it, it, one thing that it, your work reminds me of is the extent to which people's greatest strength in a crisis is what their strength was before and how you use your strengths so beautifully. And the J Blend initiative, I think, really has equipped you and the schools wonderfully well. As you said, it was uh, originally funded by Avichai at the time. The person who was driving it at Avichai was Rachel Abrams, yes. who's with us today. So, Rachel, thank you for that. And it's great that you are continuing that work at the Mayberg Foundation, so we, we appreciate it. Uh, now let me introduce Adelia Epstein, who's director of the Prisma Knowledge Center and who has led our, our efforts to gather this data and to survey the field and make sure we have the best possible data for what is going on. Adelia, over to you. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Hold on. Okay, can everyone see the slides? All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, our second pulse survey, um, which we fielded in August, and it's sort of going to give a field-wide perspective on some of the things that we've been talking about. PRISMA is dedicated to creating a strategic and systematic approach to research data collection and knowledge sharing from the field of Jewish day schools. And in the first week of August, we fielded a pulse survey for seven days. The survey received 81 responses, and the responses came from schools that covered the denominational spectrum, range of school sizes, and schools in the US and Canada. And um, what I'm gonna show you are pages from the report and the full report can be found on the Prisma Knowledge Center. Okay. So we asked schools what educational models they planned on deploying. This was again, the first week of August. And what we saw was the majority of schools said that they were going to be either fully in person or in person with an option to accommodate students who learn from home, even if the building is open. And that number cha changes based on the school division. So more than 80% of early childhood programs planned on being in person, close to 70% of grades K through five, and 65% of six through 12, a grade six through 12. So I'll just show you here, um, this light blue at the bottom is fully in person. This um, agenda is in person classes with an online option. We have next um, hybrid model. And then these small light blue and top are schools who have not made a decision about what to implement or were awaiting um, local uh, guidance from what the local regulations would be. So um, a big question is how is this in fact affecting enrollment? 37% of schools reported that they're projecting an increase in enrollment and 42% projected a decrease in enrollment. Those who cited an increase in enrollment said it was due to that um, trends that were happening in their community prior to COVID and better online learning compared to the local public schools or what uh, the local options were um, in those communities. And 18% of schools reported that they thought enrollment would be flat. So here we have 37% up, 42% down. So 65% of schools reported an increase in enrollment inquiries. And with most of those inquiries coming from students who were public school students or public school families, Schools, now tuition assistance. So on top of all of this, schools are seeing an increase in the need for tuition assistance. 80% of schools indicated an increase in tuition assistance and the total average increase is 
over the prior year, and the average total tuition assistance increase is $145,000. Okay, so as we were discussing earlier, part of reopening and all of this is, an in, is um, COVID related expenses. So in this chart we see um, at the bottom are, I'm sorry if it's, if it's a little hard to see, but at the bottom are the different categories that show what areas schools having expenditures in due to COVID related opening. So here we have PPE, cleaning and building maintenance, classroom modifications. At the end we have additional personnel here. So um, the average increase for all COVID related expenses was $173,000 and the maximum reported is $909,000. So there's really a large swing depending on the schools. Um, and the average increase cost from COVID related expenses is $669 per a student. And just to explain the chart a little bit more, this blue line at the bottom is the average and the top line, um, the red, the magenta line is the maximum. So schools are seeing an increase in expenses. Okay, so how we ask schools how they think their fundraising will change and nearly 60% of schools are projecting a decrease in fundraising. We learned from the survey that many schools are expecting a decrease in fundraising, significant additional expenses, an increase in financial aid. And while some schools are seeing an increase in enrollment increase, which may lead to higher enrollment, 42% of schools are still projecting an enrollment decrease. So like there's different stories for different schools. So it's hard to generalize about um, every school. Thank you very much, Adelia. And we, we are um, happy if anyone's got questions to dig in more to the data. Um, some of it we shared yesterday in eJewish Philanthropy, where you can see some more of it. And the actual report that Adelia was sharing, a few samples from are available on, um, uh, on, our, on our website. I mean, what, what, I, what I see are a number of things from the survey and from the work that we're doing across um, across the field. One is the incredible work that schools and school leaders, as I mentioned before, in extraordinarily challenging circumstances. And the fact that the survey shows that the vast majority are planning some form or were planning at the time of the survey, and to the best of our knowledge, it's, it, it's still true. Some form of in-person, whether fully in-person or in-person with online options or some rotating schedule and the flexibility for students and for staff is really important. Second, that the, the schools are facing up to the many challenges that this crisis uh, brings to us on top of the challenges they faced before, whether that's practical questions, educational challenges, dealing with the social and emotional and mental health of students and of uh, faculty and staff, as well as of course, very significant financial pressures. Um, uh, more than 80% of schools reported to us increases in need for tuition assistance this year. And of course, um, as Erica shared some of the direct and, and Adelia shared some of the, the direct additional costs of COVID are, um, are really important. But on the other hand, that there are some really good signs of hope, both in the way education is being prepared and delivered. And secondly, in the recognition that our schools are getting, uh, knowing that um, uh, more than half have experienced um, uh, additional inquiry, enrollment inquiries this year and good numbers of more than half have either stable or growing enrollment. We could have been facing a very acute crisis, but thanks to the work the schools have done, I think, um, we are seeing some of those positives. Let, let me just ask a, a couple of quick questions of our speakers and then I will open it up in a moment to, uh, to everyone else. Um, I guess the first question I sort of want to ask is, is looking forwards. You know, what, what do you think are the things we can do at school level, at community level, and what can our funders do in order to make us as resilient as we possibly can be and make sure that this year, whatever it brings us, is as successful as possible. Erica, maybe I'll start that with you. Sure, so just to make sure I understand the question, what, how can our communities, how can our funders, how can our networks help us to, to really withstand this and come out stronger on the other side? Is that and, the... and what are you thinking about at the school level as well to make sure you are as resilient and your community as resilient as possible? You know, I think it's, inter we had our, um, our school board retreat on, on uh, Sunday night. And so some of the conversation we were having is 
um, I, I think there's a tension right now with our enrollment is up. Our enrollment is up about 10%. We were expecting our enrollment to go up even before COVID. So this is not necessarily COVID related. We haven't had, I know Dan asked the question earlier about our kinder, our kindergarten is very large, but it was actually very large before all of this happened. And we've been, um, I've actually, I have to say, I've actually been a little bit grateful that we have not received a big influx of public school students because we're looking for students who are going to come and stay, not someone, not people who are coming just for a year. We actually have three students who we know will be here just for a year because one is in Hawaii and two are in central California and they didn't have good public school options. So we brought them in. But the point being that because our enrollment is up a little bit right now, we we're not as financially strapped this year as we feared, let's say three or four months ago. And so one of the conversations we've been having is whether we take, you know, the money that we, the tuition we're receiving, the, the fundraising, the fundraising is specifically for COVID, but are we, do we save it or do we invest in the school? And that is a big question that we're, I think that we're really balancing. Um, last night, I was having a conversation with my advancement team and my board president because our plan had originally been to send out our annual report electronically, to just make a couple of website tweaks. And my marketing director is like, I really, we need to rehaul the website. And my board chair is like, I think this is the time to send out a printed annual report and come out strong. And so we were having these conversations about where do we spend our resources right now? And where do we save? And our, in our board retreat, we did a sort of an exercise to see where people stood. And there, there definitely is this tension that exists. And so I don't know what the answer is, but I think those are the questions and the conversations we have to be having. If, we, if we're so austere in our spending and we save everything, we need people, there needs to be a reason to come to our schools. Um, and yet if we spend everything, like I, I believe that we're going to be facing the ramifications of this pandemic for the next five years. So how do we balance those short-term and long-term needs, I think is the big question right now. Thank you. Audrey, anything you want to add? Um, I just want to say it's a little bit harder for me to discuss the case by school by school case basis, but I do want to say that what we are planning to do in, in order to help the schools deal with everything that is going on right now is continue to offer them those weekly meetings and convening the heads of school to make sure that they have the support that they need from their peers as well as from us. Um, I think that all of our school's goal is to stay open and to be open in person. And I know that all of our schools have taken the necessary precautions to ensure that that happens. Um, I also want to point out that what's unique about our Miami Jewish community of day schools is that regardless of denomination, our heads of school are uh, very much in touch with one another. Um, it's not every day that you see a Rosh Yeshiva calling up the head of a community school to talk about um, scenario planning and what are they doing and what have they purchased. And um, I think also as part of the, um, Prisma North American Day School Strategy Group, um, being able to hear what happens um, across the country has been extremely helpful. And I think that what funders need to um, remember is that when all this started, public schools were not as well prepared as our Jewish day schools. And it's very important to continue to invest in our day schools because they have really risen to the occasion during this pandemic. And we need to ensure that they remain standing and alive and well to you know after this whole thing is over to to make sure we have where to send our, our jewish children thank you adelia just want to bring you in as well um as you look across all of the data and thank you for sharing the individual pieces about it what do you think it tells us about the state of uh, of jewish education and, and what do you think is next in terms of what we need to know as we look ahead um so I think the data tells us that there's a cycle going on um, within some of our schools, within a lot of our schools, that there's going to be serious, there are serious financial burdens due to decreased fundraising, increased cost, increase in financial aid. And we have to be there for our schools. We have to support our schools. We need to continue to give them the support they need to thrive. 
Um, and, but in, not in all schools is the situation that bleak. Many schools are seeing um, an increase in enrollment. We didn't ask, I just wanna say, we didn't ask about increased enrollment. We asked about increased in enrollment inquiries. Um, so many schools are possibly seeing an increase in enrollment due to this from public school families. And so there is some, some gold lining <laughs> to all of this. And um, this is putting a serious financial stress on, on many of our schools. Um, and then I think there's some big questions that we still need to explore. And like, how do we retain some of these new families that we're attracting? Um, what space is there for remote learning when we're not in a pandemic? Um, how do we take, oh, one of the things that I, that I didn't mention in the slide was, um, that's in the full report is about budget cuts and um, what area schools did budget cuts in. And the top area was in professional development. So how do we take care of um, professional development when the professional development budgets are slashed? And so, so, so those are some of the big questions to, that I think need further exploration. Thank you. I want to bring in um, one or two other people from the call, given that they have a lot of experience and expertise in some of the areas we're touching on. Let's, let's start with sort of a little more on the enrollment question. And in case anyone missed uh, the, the chat, Arnie, you were making comments on it. I'd just be interested to sort of get your perspective in Boston uh, from Arnie Winshaw and from uh, JCDS's point of view. Oh, thanks, Paul. And thanks to everybody uh, for your sharing all this information. Um, I, 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 we've seen much of this, some of the same themes that have been brought up here. First of all, amazing collaboration across schools. Uh, and the communication, there was already good communication, but this was really uh, real intentional work together. Uh, let's raise the, let's pay attention to our day schools and strengthening our day schools and, and, and work strongly together. Um, I think that uh, starting in the spring, we actually started to see inquiries even potentially for the end of school to have uh, students uh, move because there was demonstrated the degree to which the day schools were able to first pivot very quickly. And thank you, Prisma, for really coordinating a lot of sharing across the country to help schools, uh, early schools that had to shut down early and very much you know, were willing to share so much about their experience what was working and what wasn't working. And I think that really uh, fostered tremendous collaboration across the day school movement, but it also highlighted the degree to which our schools could respond individually to students and to families. And, ha and as Prisma actually pushed very clearly, and, and I'm privileged to be part of a, a group, a professional learning community called DEEP, that provide uh, embedded expertise in professional development in day schools. And we also convened multiple organizations supporting the day schools. The need for direct communication, clear communication, responsiveness, getting feedback from our parents, our families, et cetera, that all helped to really improve the responsiveness of schools and, and word spread by uh, word of mouth spread to other families. And I think, um, Erica, I know you expressed a, a concern about parents coming over from public school during COVID and it potentially being short term, but we're actually seeing these initial families that are coming over from public schools noticing immediately the difference of what it means to be part of these Jewish, nurturing Jewish communities. And, um, and I actually think that, that uh, families will stay. As, as long as their kids thrive, they will rethink what they've been doing for their kids and how they're part of a, a really an embraced Jewish community that serves not only the kids, but the families. The other piece that I think we haven't necessarily touched on, but the degree to which the schools have really cared about their teachers and their staff. And, and I think that's also a part that has distinguished the schools, the values that actually guide our day schools 
and the mission-driven elements of our day schools have played out in all the constituencies and, and, and that has really strengthened it. I don't know if I answered all your questions. Well, that's terrific, thank you. I, I want to pick up on a, another point, uh, which is the professional development question. And Rachel, thank you for, for putting comments in chat. One of the things that uh, we've been very proud of this summer is uh, the partnership that we have with uh, the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge um, uh, and United, which Rachel really orchestrated to provide professional development in online teaching and learning. Um, and Rachel, sort of as, as you look ahead, what do you think might be possible in terms of future PD and what could, if a community is interested in doing something, what would we say to them? Um, so first of all, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I think two things. Number one is a large challenge that we're seeing is um, this issue that now I heard a great term for it yesterday. I kind of called concurrent learning, where there is learning that's happening in person, but there are significant numbers of students that are at home. And so many schools have planned over the summer for the technology that's needed to make that happen, whether that's OWLs, you know, OWL devices in classrooms, Zoom, uh, allowing for students to Zoom into class. But one of the things that many teachers are finding um, is that just watching Zoom is not enough, right? There, there has to be a way of engaging those students who are at home in a different way and in an integrated way into the class. And that's, I think, something that many teachers are going to need help with as we continue uh, this coming year. So, um, you know, we've been thinking about what next steps are post the summer workshops that we have done. Um, there are definitely ways to work with any of the providers, whether they are the ones we used in the summer, Better Lesson or United, whether they are the ones involved, um, you know, in the deep community that Arnie uh, mentioned that JAIC is facilitating and to think about um, partnerships, right, between national funders like JIC and the Mayberg Foundation and local funders. That's a model that I used, sorry, very successfully in communities before. Boston, Miami, Seattle with the Samus Foundation, or we've, we partnered um, with them to bring better lessons to Seattle for a number of years. And that's a model that has proven to be fairly successful in terms of both a financial model, but also supporting um, schools and communities, right, in a way that has, I think, we've all learned is very important. The notion of networking among teachers and among schools, um, and that communities really see, the, the national perspective is very important, but the local funder and implementer on the ground really understands what's happening in their own community. That's a very, very valuable partnership. So, as I said, if people are interested in thinking about that more, you know, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Rachel. Sort of, you know, the, ne the next pillar I wanted to mention is uh, just to go back to funding questions. Um, and uh, as you, many of you may have seen, uh, there was a big announcement yesterday by UJ Federation of New York of, of new funding. And I just wanted to call on Javi Khan just to, to, to share where that is at and what you're able to do for your schools. Thank you so much, Paul, for your leadership. And I just want to say thank you to Prisma in general and the funders and the communal professionals and educational leaders this has been a long road, which is an evolving journey. We're all in this together. At UJA Federation, we've looked at this crisis unfold in three different ways. The first acute phase, when I think delusionally, we all thought, okay, this will last until Pesach, was sort of an acute phase. And then we realized that this was a situation that was continuing and here to stay. In the first piece of this crisis, UJA Federation, and let me just say that there are 200 schools in our catchment area. Um, we invested $2 million for a COVID scholarship fund specifically for COVID impacted families in response to what we were hearing from schools and what was um, underscored in the data of the significant increase in tuition assistance requests. That was phase number one. Now we're in phase number two as schools realized that they needed to get together their leadership teams to do scenario planning, we worked closely with our partner, the Jewish Education Project, to help schools do the scenario planning and looking to the fall to reopen. I'm pleased to share that schools will reopen in New York. Uh, that's the good news. 
the not so good news, as we all know, is that there are unprecedented reopening costs. And as Paul just mentioned, I'm pleased to share that we just, the board of UJA just announced a $2.1 million COVID response reopening fund, where we will, we, we plan to help 47 schools and 34,000 students to go back to school in a safe environment and to help the schools continue to, to thrive in the face of adversity. Um, I also wanna mention from a funding perspective that this $2.1 million fund was in conjunction with a generous contribution from the Paul E. Singer Foundation. So this was an example where a funding relationship helped amplify a fund that's going to, to benefit a wide swath of schools across the denominational and geographic uh, spectrum. And I just finally wanna say, looking ahead, I hope that uh, federations and communal institutions will help to incentivize the silver lining in this, which has been collaboration uh, among schools. And um, who knows what the future will hold, but I, I sincerely hope that we, that we all stand shoulder to shoulder with our schools as they face significant challenges. And thank you all for your support. Thank you, Javi, and thanks to UJ Federation. And, and also just uh, to mention that the Paulie Singer Foundation, who, uh, as Javi mentioned, are part of that, and also with us have done some funding in other parts of the country as well. Um, in recent months and uh, their, their entry and work in the day school field now uh, really is tremendous along with the other funders in the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund. Uh, so we're very appreciative to them and to others. It's been interesting, we, we ran a webinar a couple of weeks ago uh, with the LaFell School who'd been using a lot of social media tools, not specifically around uh, COVID, but uh, had, had seen some great results from their outreach efforts and from social media and from um, the outreach they were doing. Of course, one of the things we have to bear in mind, um, uh, sort of beneath the data that Adelia was sharing earlier on about the inquiry schools have had is it's, 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 it can be locally very different. As Audrey said, there are specific dynamics, I think, that, that genuinely do influence Miami. And one of the things we're conscious of is uh, the debates going on specifically in New York City at the moment about population movement. Um, and how the Manhattan schools in particular are among those that are facing the greatest enrollment challenges right now and really having to, to deal with that, uh, which of course then benefits for those people who maybe moved to Florida or for those people who simply moved to the suburbs, um, but that, that creates some dynamic. But I do believe that coming out of this, we will see not just a redistribution of students from one Jewish day school to another, we will see some net gain and I think the, uh, the challenge that, if, if you like, Arnie was articulating is uh, to the extent that there may be some, and Erica, sort of you're sharing your concern on this, some that we are, we don't know what their long-term commitment will be. It's on us to give them the reasons to make the commitment long-term. And then I think work that we want to be doing with, uh, with our partners is really thinking about how do we build on the incredible good that has always existed in day schools and the even greater good that has existed in the last few months to tell the story and demonstrate the value proposition of Jewish day schools. Can I share an anecdote that I think, um, Please. You know, this Please happened to us, but I think this could happen in almost, you know, in very many of the Jewish day schools and perhaps answers your question, Martine. So we had a family who joined us last year from public school and it was a it was a really hard decision for them because they had intentionally chosen public school for financial reasons. They had intentionally decided where they wanted to be using their financial resources. And it, it, public school wasn't feeling great to them. And so they transferred to Pressman. Um, you know, four months after basically this very difficult decision, the pandemic comes and we all close down. And I was like, oh man, like this is... So I reached out to them. It was probably like three weeks in. I said, I just want to check in. I know this is not what you were expecting. And they said, thank God we joined just in time. They said, just as all of this was happening, we can't imagine having navigated this without our community. So thank you. And it was like really this moment of realizing that what people are choosing us for, right? It goes beyond the math or the Tanakh or the Hebrew. And so we do have to make sure that we're actualizing our mission and giving people that full experience. And then yes, I agree with Arnie that they'll stay so long as their kids thrive. 
I just want to add one thing to that is also the importance that Jewish day schools place on professional development. If our schools had not been prepared the way they had, they were prepared, thanks to J. Blend Miami, um, word of mouth, like Erica was explaining, would probably not have been as popular or as useful, knowing that it ran across the community that certain of our schools were doing such a great job that the transition was somewhat seamless to distance learning played a huge part in having more people come down to Miami and decide to join. That I is think a, it's very important. That's a great and positive place for us to wrap up. We, we've aggregated a lot of what we're hearing from schools in our Dynamic Day Schools campaign and brought together videos, which we intend to continue doing. But to Martine's point, there is a lot more work for us to do. I just want to say a huge thank you to Erica, to Audrey, to Adelia, and, uh, and to Tamara and Jewish Funders Network. Uh, and to everyone for being part of this conversation. And I'm glad we have been able to have a, have a great conversation. Thank you all for, for being with us. Tamar, just hand back to you to, to, end, to finish up. Thank, thank you. Yes, I want to echo the thank you to all of the presenters. And really to everybody here, it was wonderful to see the back and forth and the, the sharing throughout on the chat and the sharing right now is exactly what we're trying to do is bring you all together to, to learn together and to talk together. Um, and so I hope that you'll join us again soon. We're going to continue to have these kind of updates. Please reach out to me if you have ideas and if you want to present at a future one and we'll continue to, to grow together and learn together and see how we can you know, create impact in our community. And, and with that, thank you again. Stay safe, good luck in the back to school season and Shana Tova.